The book of Hebrews is a warning. It's a warning against apostasy. That is, a warning against a professing believer departing from the Lord Jesus Christ, departing from the truth of God's Word, the Bible, departing from a true church. More specifically, Hebrews is written in the first instance to Jewish converts to Christianity in the first century AD, warning them against apostasy, particularly warning them against leaving the Lord Jesus to go back to a Christless Judaism. To this end, Hebrews repeatedly contrasts the Old Testament church economy with the New Testament church economy and testifies that the new covenant in Christ Jesus is a far better covenant with better promises because it has a better priesthood and a better sacrifice and a better altar in a better tabernacle. And then it adds repeatedly that if anyone goes back from Jesus Christ to the bondage of the Old Testament law, they perish under the wrath of an angry God. In the second half of Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 through 29, summarizes the main points of the book of Hebrews under the imagery of two mountains, Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. And you could say, as far as the Bible is concerned, there really only are two mountains, and you belong to one or the other. Look at your Bible with me. Hebrews 12, from verse 18 to verse 21, deals with Mount Sinai, this mountain that burns with fire and blackness and darkness that causes people to tremble. Then, verses 22 through 24 moves to the second mountain, Mount Zion. Verse 22, Ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, and so on. And the remainder of the chapter, from verse 25 to verse 29, is an exhortation not to return to Mount Sinai, but to persevere and remain with Mount Zion. So you can see that the two mountains, the title of this brief series on Hebrews 12 verses 18 through 29, the two mountains is the unifying theme of the passage. These two mountains, Sinai and Zion, are sharply contrasted. Mount Sinai is Mount Doom, if you will. It's a terrifying mountain. An unapproachable mountain. And you must never go there. But Zion is a blessed mountain. Because in Zion dwells the triune God, the holy angels, and the faithful saints, and the Lord Jesus Christ, the mediator of the new and better covenant. Stick with the heavenly Jerusalem, which is the church of our Lord Jesus and over the next few weeks of examining these two mountains, we should grow in our understanding of the Old Testament church and its forms of worship as contrasted with the glory of the New Testament church and its worship in Jesus Christ. We shall learn something about apostasy, which is departing from the living God and Resolve afresh to cleave to Christ and his people. We shall also come more clearly to evaluate Judaism, <coughs> which is, in today's parlance, one of the major world religions. And thereby we shall also come to understand and critique sharply Interfaith dialogue and worship, which 
wrongly proceeds on the idea that ultimately all religions lead to God. They don't. Jesus Christ leads to God and all other religions are the broad way which leads to destruction. Let's turn then this morning to our text, which I shall now reread. Hebrews 12, verses 18 through 21. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness, and darkness, and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated, that the word should not be spoken to them any more, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touch the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Consider then the first of the two mountains, Mount Sinai. First, the religious idea of Mount Sinai. Second, the terrible phenomena at Mount Sinai. And third, the fearful responses at Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai, the religious idea, the terrible phenomena, and the fearful responses. Now, to Gain, the religious idea of Mount Sinai we need to understand a little bit about how the Jews thought, especially in the first century AD. They boasted in their religious privileges. We have a wonderful shrine containing holy furniture. And the children here ought to be able to say what that religious shrine is. The tabernacle, later the temple with levers and altars and so forth. At this glorious tabernacle or temple, the priesthood officiates. Those only of the family of Aaron, served by the Levites. And prominent in the work of the priests, aided by the Levites, was the offering up of sacrifices. The burnt offering, the meal offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, the trespass offering, as well as heave offerings, wave offerings, and all the rest. And the Jews gloried in this. This was the greatest thing about them. And along with all this, they have their laws, statutes, commandments, judgments, testimonies, and precepts covering many, many areas telling you what you are allowed to eat and what you are not allowed to eat, telling you what to do if you contracted leprosy, dealing with ceremonial cleansing and the laws concerning religious festivals and all the rest. And the Jews boasted in all these things, tabernacle or temple, priesthood, sacrifices, <coughs> laws, because God gave them to us. God gave them to us as a particular token of his love and favor for us. And he didn't do it for any other nation. Moreover, God gave us these laws and this Old Testament worship many hundreds of years ago. So that our worship and laws are very venerable, hoary with antiquity. And now this, and this is the key idea of our text. Where was Israel when God gave Israel these laws and this worship? At Mount Sinai. That's the significance for us this morning. God gave the blueprint for the tabernacle, later developed as the temple, and Moses built the tabernacle at Sinai. The tribe of Levi was set apart at Sinai. The priests were dedicated at Sinai. And guess where the rules for the sacrifices were made? Sinai. 